This is an episode of our podcast, guest starring Tony Goldmark from Escape from Vault Disney. If you're interested in an episode of Escape from Vault Disney, guest starring us, the curators Charlie, Ella, and Shelby, that one is out. It exists. It's called Chippendale Rescue Rangers 2022. Find it on PipeDreamPodcasts.com under the Escape from Vault Disney tab or wherever you get your podcasts. So take me forth to my native land with the mystery shack and our crewmates man. Me satchel's back so let's find the sands where I hit my sailor's heart. <laughs> Welcome ye to Mystery Shack Look Back, a nostalgic time capsule and no-spoiler book club of the original Gravity Falls fandom. I'm your lesser curator, Charlie. And uh, I, as well, am your similarly inferior curator, Ella. And Ella and Charlie have written for me to say it, I am your best curator, Shelby. Because it's true, (laughs) honestly. It's true. (laughs) Because the amount of research that you have put into the this episode and the previous episode, Cypher Hunt... Totals more research than Ellen have, and I have done the entire podcast. That's correct. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's like... You, you hear this? This is my descent into madness. So you're saying there is no docent named Pepe Silvio? What about the male, Shelby? Oh, the male! Tell me about the male! The male! <laughs> I haven't watched that episode in a while, but that is what I just said into madness. Yes, my boy. You have always kind of been uh, a curator in spirit for the duration of the show, but now that we are doing these episodes a little more spaced out. I'm more spaced out, that's for sure. For sure. Yeah. Since we finished the series proper, uh, we, we have, we are able to bring you on as the curator, you know, on the actual show. Yeah. Because Shelby works 40 hours a freaking week. Yeah. But, the amount of research, like we said, that you put into this episode and the previous episode. And, and the first episode. Don't forget, uh, you were still busy with school, so Shelby it's, actually did the yeah. research with it's me. It's all proportional <laughs> to the amount that we did for the 40 plus other episodes. Yeah. <laughs> That's oh, 50, four, 50, 49 episodes. Uh, anyway, this is episode 50. Hey! We're covering the Choose Your Own Adventure book. Select Your Own Choose Venture book. Yeah, okay. We're covering the book. Gravity Falls, Dipper and Mabel, and the Curse of the Time Pirates Treasure, exclamation point, colon, a selector own choose venture. <laughs> Please contact us on Twitter at Mystery Shack Pod or in our Discord, which is linked uh, on PipeTreePodcast.com to compliment us for fitting as much of that as possible in the podcast <laughs> title. And what a, you know, what a, what a, what a 50th episode, you know, what a topic to cover on our 50th episode, a, a book that probably very few Gravity Falls fans have read. Yeah. Yeah. What would have been a good idea for a big 50 is maybe if we had gotten, like, Jason Ritter and Alex Hirsch. Oh, to talk about, like, the cypher hunt. Yeah, that would have been good for a 50th. Oh, that would have been perfect. Yeah. But unfortunately, we're stuck with this uh, silly little book that we quite liked. Uh, And our docent... Tony Goldmark. Hello. Oh yes, well, welcome, welcome, Tony Goldmark. How are you? It's it's great to be back. Tony Goldmark of the Escape from Vault Disney podcast, another Pipe Dream podcast, but also read this book with us uh, just the other day at the time of this recording. Indeed, we live streamed reading through uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure style story with the live chat uh, voting on which paths to take, and it was a really fun time, and we really uh, really enjoyed it. And I drank a normal amount of rum. You did, and and you uh, have a very different idea of a normal amount of rum than I do, Charlie. I am a pirate, Tony. So oh, I was true. actually really, really waiting for this one. <laughs> so this is a Gravity Falls book written in the Choose Your Own Adventure style. It was released on July twenty sixth, twenty sixteen, coinciding with the release of the official. Journal 3, released in kind of a twin format. Like Pokemon Red and Blue! Exactly like Pokemon Red and Blue! And Zelda, Oracle of Ages, and Oracle of Seasons! Exactly like those things that exist! Uh, It was written by Gravity Falls writer Jeff Rowe, with uh, some story help from Alex Hirsch. And the art is by Emmy Sisiriga, a storyboard artist from the show. And it is worth noting that Jeff Rowe is the basis of the character Brett Hands on... uh, um, Yeah, sorry, Hands. We we speculate. Izzy Hands, Brett Hand. (laughs) Yeah, okay, got it, got it. Um, And it is pretty clear uh, that the character of Brett Hand from the Netflix original series Inside Job is based on 
series creator Shion Takeuchi sharing a cubicle with him uh, in their time in Gravity Falls and becoming best friends. Um, so uh, Shelby watched a bunch of interviews with Jeff Rowe on his movie he co-wrote and co-directed, Mitchells vs. the Machines, and um, has assured us that Brett Hand is not an exaggerated <laughs> character. I mean, I remember when we watched it, I was like, Oh no, this guy just started doing push ups. That's Jeff Rowe. Yeah, isn't there literally a story about Jeff Rowe doing a lot of yeah, push ups? There is. Yes, he would regularly do push ups in the office, but one time he uh, challenged Alex to a sit up competition, and Alex ma- wound up getting up to a thousand and could not move for the next couple <laughs> days of work. He's like a. He's a different flavor of Mike Rianda, which is probably why they worked so well together on Mitchell's versus the Definitely. Machines in terms of yes, their energy. And, and they were best friends in college. And uh-huh. um, Michael Rianda would give rewrite notes on Jeff Rose's scripts for Gravity Falls because they did not work on the show mm-hmm. at the same time. Yeah. But uh, all I'm saying is this book is written by the real life Brett Hand, and I don't think that's a bad no, thing. No, definitely but you can, not. I think it gets, you know, this book kind of gets overlooked a lot for various reasons. One of them maybe being that Alex Hirsch himself has relatively little, uh, you know, to do with mm-hmm. it. But there's also the fact that when it was advertised and tweeted about, it was like, this is a non-canon book, right, Shelby? Yes. But it does have pirate cannons. It does. does. It does have a lot of cannons. And that Journal 3 came out the same day. Well, that so too, if you yes. only had money for one book. That too. The Get the Cannon one. So, yes, it is specifically non-canon within the Gravity Falls uh, story because it has so many different endings. Specifically, it has... 34 different endings. That you found via painstakingly going through all the endings. Well done. That is correct. My book is full of sticky notes and tabs now. That's the best way to read a book, to be honest. The A Books link will be in the description. Um, You can go through it blind and just discover what there is out there. Or Shelby has, (laughs) I guess, made a walkthrough? There's a walkthrough of a book? <laughs> yes. Sort of a series of flow charts, yeah? Like a... I mean, a choose-your-own-adventure book, yeah, I, that that would need a walkthrough. Shelby chooses your adventure. <laughs> I, cho- I mapped out all of your adventures. You arrive on your ship, and Shelby's there with like a hundred charts, and it's like, all right, good, I know exactly I what course we're going to I can't go anywhere take. until you look at the map. In spite of the fact... <laughs> I love it when you point at the map. <laughs> In spite of the fact that I voice Mabel for a lot of Charlie's things, I uh, am Dipper 100%. This you are. It's true. And it's true. I have the opposite <laughs> energy. In spite of the fact that I voice Dipper so much, I am basically Mabel. And despite the fact that I cosplayed reality warping space entity Bill Cipher during the live stream, I wait. No, that's that's, that's just pretty correct. On the nose. Yeah, yeah. That's just that's, Ella. Yeah, that's pretty much on the and nose. And even though I voiced Blendon Blandon in the live stream. I am really the ghost of Winston <gasps> Churchill inhabiting a pile of loose wigs. Wow. That's awesome for you. We love that for <laughs> I love you. That. Tony. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. You know what? Live your truth. But uh what did you think of the book, Tony? Ah, uh, it was it was a Gravity Falls book. It was a lot of fun. It was very funny. It had a lot of uh intri- it, it 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 really felt to a large extent, like you were reading an animation script. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There were visual a, gags described. Yeah, like, there, there were so many it. visual gags that you could instantly see in your head that, that you just knew the timing of intrinsically. But also there's a lot of, like, you know, just kind of base description of what the characters are doing. Like, you know, they sit, they, you know... They talk. They, a lot of gulping. There was a lot of gulping in this book for some reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, whenever characters are in trouble, it's like that's how you identify that I, they know yes, they're, that's true. they're in trouble. That's true. They could have bit their nails in one. One of them could have jumped in the other's arms like Shaggy and Scooby in another. Yeah, but who's got the time? We have all the time in the world. We we have a time machine. Ah, uh, yeah, that's sharp. Uh, but, but yeah, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was, it, it, it was a nice glimpse into, it, it felt like a Gravity Falls episode that never got made. Which technically it was. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So, um, I was going to call him Brett. Um, so Jeff wrote. <laughs> Close enough. Yeah, so Jeff wrote several versions of Blendon's game, specifically two, but that, that's several in my book. He wrote two versions of Blendon's game. Several. S- how many versions we got? Several versions. <laughs> Thank you. Well, he wrote, he wrote, it, it was not about the, qu- qu- it was each version of Blendon's game that he wrote 
contained every single idea that the crew pitched. Remember Dose Hunt Thou, Jeff? Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, no. Je- yeah. Do- Jeff Jeff valiantly tried to incorporate every single in- idea we yeah, had yeah, yeah. and made it work. D- Dose I feel Hunt like Thou- that was my greatest <laughs> skill as a writer is that I had this like magnet brain that I'm just like, I can see a way that all of these ideas fit together and like, let's just get it all. Like, and I have a wrecking ball brain. I'm like, I see a way that these things fitting together don't fit together. <laughs> Um, the Dose Hunt Thou, a little background on that character. That was just like a Jeff way of saying uh, two hundred thousand dollars. I was like, I want to, I want to make a hun, hun, hundred thousand, a hunt thou. You know what? I want d- two hunt thou, Dose Hunt Thou. And then I was like, that sounds like the name of a Star Wars character. And then we were yeah. like, what if Dose Hunt Thou is this amazing bounty hunter from the future who's got a time gun that can make you a baby or make you an old man? And so there was like probably fifteen yeah. pages of them fighting Dose Hunt Thou. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and hey, uh, Dose Hunt Thou, some some jokes never die. Like Dose Hunt Thou found his way into the uh, uh, the book. The, the choose oh, your, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Pick your own choose venture. <laughs> Jeff also book. wrote the pick your own choose venture. So Doth, Dose Hunt Thou lives again in book form. Because he managed to pull that off in 48 hours, he got a standing mm-hmm. ovation from the entire crew after the table read. And he probably... Table read Stan wiped a tear <laughs> from his eye. And then, he, then he probably like flexed or something or put, did yeah, push-ups. No, or start, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, ripped his shirt off. Yeah. And um, The standing ovation was for the second one that he wrote. The first one he wrote was... Yeah mostly focused on the future and was mm. intermingled with the Seuss storyline. And he kept fighting for that one while everybody else in the crew was fighting for the second one to be the one that they ended up making. That's interesting because we also talked about um, an alternate ending to the episode that was fought over. So it's like yeah. this that whole episode was just fraught with with these debates. This is the return of old murder joke Jeff, Jeffy Fresh, the one and only. <laughs> so, um <laughs> When do they call him murder joke Jeff? In the Blendens game, he's like he calls himself <laughs> old murder joke Jeff. Yeah, good old murder joke Jeff as they used to uh, used to call me. Well, I mean, the, but this is one of the reasons that like I was like we need you on this show. I remember reading your writing test and it's like a lot of people see their writing for kids. A kids network and they they pull their punches yeah, and yeah, I would yeah. rather a writer come out with really crazy funny stuff that maybe we can't use all of it and like I'll be the one to say alright I'll fight for this this right. one will take out than to have them pre-censor themselves before they arrive also he calls himself Stabby the Boss Cat Stabby the Boss Cat was what I wanted people to call me and no one ever <laughs> was there a reason just- I just thought it was a fun combination of words. Like, <laughs> I'm Stabby the Boss Cat. What's up? Pew, pew, pew. Stabby, Stabby. So this I'm- is the first commentary we've had Jeff on, and now everybody who's <laughs> listened to this point realizes yeah. like they, how much they've been missing out on. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. He regularly, he regularly gives himself nicknames. I remember that. And, and other people nicknames. It's also, I don't remember which commentary, but apparently he always insisted on voicing Mabel for the table reads, mm-hmm. which makes a lot of sense. Table Mabel. Yeah, table Mabel. Ta- he is the Table he Mabel. Is table Mabel. <laughs> um. So the the non canon aspect does admittedly bring me back to some of the fan response to Roadside Attraction because you know mm-hmm. I, I was thinking about this earlier and this idea of non canon because what Alex tweeted was the book is essentially non canon since it has many different endings and obviously every ending can't be canon because that does well i mean in the multiverse sure but in this i was gonna say we can if we include it in the multiverse it is canon but don't you see loki every ending is canon it's all canon (laughs) (laughs) so but he said uh but it does contain one enormous canon secret so that definitely attracted people to read it but i think Mm -hmm. the idea that it has to be canon to be worth your time is weird and also I don't know how to break this to them, but all of it's made up. All of it is <laughs> oh, know, yeah. is a made-up story. You can just decide that something is canon if you want it to be. Yeah, that's in your brain. In my brain, um, Time Pirates Treasure, featuring more pirates than any other Gravity Falls story, is the only mm-hmm. canon Gravity Falls story. I'm sorry, Bill yeah. Cipher? I don't know who that is. There you go. Well, apparently, some some people do, but we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, there is one <laughs> Gravity Falls episode that really happened, but we're not uh, we're not allowed to tell you which one. <laughs> yes, so you just have to watch all of it to find out. That was the only one that takes place outside of Tommy Westfall's snow globe. <laughs> You know, Gravity Falls crossed over with The Simpsons was crossed over with X-Files, which had Detective Munch on it, 
who was in an episode of St. Elsewhere, so yep. Gravity Falls actually all takes place within Tommy Westfall's snow globe. Uh, it certainly does. Uh, spoilers. <laughs> uh, again, except for one episode, uh, which was a documentary filmed in real time. But one of the episodes of Gravity Falls is a real snuff film. Try and guess which one. Yes, mm-hmm. that is true. Yeah. We know this. We all do this. I think that sometimes with the with the fandom, and most fandoms, like, if it does not pertain to the overarching whatever, it, it isn't really worth one's time. And I get it, because again, like Charlie said, if you only have enough money for one book, you're going to get Journal 3. But people tend to, you know, overlook the, the fun part of Gravity Falls, because it's a really Gravity Fallsy book. I think... Yep. Where, is, yeah. where the only place that Alex's mostly absence is really felt is the twin dialogue, because I know he writes a lot of it himself. Mm-hmm. But as far as like the jokes in general and the tone and and the arcs, like it it all feels like gravity. It's balls. there. It's it, there are arcs in here about making choices, which is exactly the kind of Gravity Falls like meta commentary that they would bring to something like this. It's similar to like how they approach. Pine's Quest or, or Dipper and Mabel's Guide, where they look at the format that they're in and they work that into some kind of through line or, or emotional narrative. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely true. And I, yeah, like, I, I feel like there are places where the dialogue between the twins does, like, lack a little bit of that sparkle. But I feel like he, I don't think that anybody else except for Jeff Rowe could have written this book. It's the Jeff Rowiest book ever written. It really is. No, yeah, because it's that was his baby, you know, like that draft of Blunton's game. That was his baby. Bo- yeah. yeah, he had to. Uh, uh, copies of this book were also given out to fans who were waiting at the post office during the cipher hunt at the P.O. box clue. They were waiting for that to be opened, and copies of Do this you think book Jason were given got out. One? Maybe, but based on the the most fans. Re- response to this book coming out, they probably all went, ugh. <laughs> we have to read this while we wait for the clue? <laughs> I mean, they had so much time to think about it. That's true. They have time to overanalyze it. It's which true. we do as well. Yes, of course, of course. Um, the book also came with a nifty, double-sided poster. Uh, one side was a wanted poster for Dipper and Mabel uh, from the cowboy era, and the other side was a recruitment poster for the Time Force, or Time Paradox Avoidance Enforcement Squadron, or Time Anomaly Removal. They're very inconsistent with what the name of this organization is, because Blendon says that he's part of the Time Anomaly Removal Crew. Lolf and Dundren are part of the Time Paradox Avoidance Enforcement Squadron, and here they just call it the Time Force. So I think that it's, I I think it's the Time Force, and then Dolph and Lundgren are in a different department than Blended Blandon. Oh, okay, yeah, oh. that makes sense. Yeah, so I think that's... I was gonna bureaucracy. Say, yeah. I was going to say they they just... The timeline has been altered, like, three times now, and that the name has been changed somehow through the butterfly effect three times. I like that, but also I do think that, but like, yeah, there think are different right. departments, because they don't wear right. the same outfit. Yeah. For a baby, the time baby is very good at organizing a bureaucracy. I Yeah. And naming things... He, he does name everything. <laughs> During our uh, live stream, uh, the paths we took, and if you get the book yourself, you could take your own path, or <laughs> let Shelby navigate. <laughs> First, we, we had to go to the Old West, of course. The Old West clearly is, like, very inspired by a lot of Old West trope. And Back to the Future 3 a lot. <laughs> yes. Well, Back to the Future 3 is a is in itself a bunch of Old That's West tropes. That's also true. But how many times in the stream did one of us, or most of us, quote... A Back to the Future movie, pretty often. I mean, I think it's I th- it's at least two of our favorite movies. Is it your favorite movie, too? Ella, yes. Tony, is it one of your favorites? One of mine, definitely. Uh, definitely, so it's though. Of, it's uh, pretty high on our all of our Though I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider the third Back to the Future my favorite Back to the Future. <laughs> no, no, fair. the first one is the, it goes one, then three, then two for me. Yeah, we can all agree that one is a perfect movie, minus the, well... Well... <laughs> I, mean, I, I love all of them, but for me, it goes one, two, three. <laughs> okay. Yeah, nice. that's fair. I, I respect that. I respect that, that too. Um, I, but can we agree that the best Indiana Jones is three, yes. then one, then sure, two? Sure, sure. You're three, right. Three, then one, and then four two. doesn't make the list. Four? To, four? There's a fourth one? Yeah, I'd go. I'd go uh, one, three, two on that one. But okay. Really? No, that's, that's fair. That's, that's fair. That's fair. 
Okay. What about Indiana Jones 5, gang? Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Indiana Jones, we have to make this while Harrison can still technically walk. Oh, no. You all sound so optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, James Mangold, I know he's he's good, but... Don't, uh, we don't have to worry about the walking, because they're actually going to puppeteer him. Oh, of course, movie, of course. It? ILM's doing my legs. <laughs> I guess, to be fair, all of the odd-numbered movies have been good, so maybe we That's should have true. a Yeah, it's it's it's... It's the anti Star Trek, yeah. So yeah, the what did we do in the old west? Oh We went to the uh to the mine. And, and we met Jugsley. Uh, Jugsley I loved Tony as Jugsley, that yeah Jugsley suspiciously looking and sounding like old man McGucket. Emmy worthy. I uh I, I, I mean that's yeah, just a fun voice to do at, at any time, no matter what. We came to a fork where we could either go down a dark cavern that Jugsley was motioning us towards suspiciously or go an alternate route, and we voted to trust Jugsley. Because his performance was so compelling. That's true. It's really Tony's fault. No one's so crazy that they'd look you in the eye and deliberately lead you to your death. The twins in Blendon follow Jugsley a few steps down the path. Well, here's your deaths, says Jugsley. He cheerfully kicks Blendon and the twins into the pit. woo You lot fell for that right quick. <laughs> he laughs. Wow, that was a dumb choice. I'm so clearly a maniac. <laughs> I'm so obviously a maniac. Yep, and and I am. That's my favorite line in the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a second. Is there's no curse? Oh uh, yeah. Huh. It's just about. It's Dipper and Mabel and the Time Pirates treasure. There's no curse. I, there was no curse for the Time Pirates treasure, but there is like. A couple of endings where it kind of is kind of like a curse. But it says the curse of. Of the Time Pirate's Treasure, yeah. I think treasure, it's yeah. the curse is like the pursuit of the Time Pirate's Treasure. Oh, I is... thought it was that um, a- after the ending where Dipper and Mabel bury it, um, they will find they can't eat mm-hmm. anything. They can't feel the wind on their face. And so they'll have to go bring it back to... Um... Mm-hmm. But that's... yeah. That's another story. It's more guidelines. Oh, okay. There are 34 different endings. So among those endings, there are six options where you can live out the rest of your life in the past with a wide variety of outcomes from the twins becoming outlaws, which is actually previewed when you get into the Old West. They talk about the outlaws that they become if they choose to stay in the past. Yeah, it's a it's a recursion kind of thing. And that's who oh, they are yeah. on the poster in the, bo- uh, the pullout poster. Yes. The Calamity Brothers. Yeah. Non-binary icon Mabel Pines. confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's true. She is wearing a fake mustache in the poster that came with the book. Yeah. It's so good. Love it. Love a good fake mustache. Um, but yeah, from becoming outlaws all the way to dying in the French Revolution with a little Les Mis, uh, <laughs> little <laughs> just call back in There's there. There's one in which Dipper marries a medieval princess who's a dead ringer for Wendy, uh, which is really weird. I hate that one. Yeah. <laughs> Really weird. So there are four where they can live out in the future, which is usually a in the prison. Sometimes they just go insane. Or sometimes it's the museum of the past, which is a fun ending. Yeah, which is a prison in and of itself. That's true. <laughs> Museums are kind of yeah. like prisons, so we really are wardens. So that means Tony's our prisoner. Yes. No, no. Tony's a Tony's a docent, which means that Tony. Oh, he's a, a right. part time no, guard. I, 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 it's cool. I'm a I'm a prisoner. I'm I accept it. Well, we're all prisoners of our own minds. Yeah, know? it's true. That's true. And then there's 11 where they can live out in the present to varying degrees of, like, happiness, boredom, misery. Yeah, because there's an option where you could just straight up say no to the adventure. You could just go home oh, yeah. before it starts, which is really funny. Yeah, the shortest path is, like, literally decline. Yeah, yeah. When Blodin say- says, do you want to go on an adventure, you have the option to say... Nah. <laughs> and then I think that there's a line in there where it's like you watch a documentary about making bad decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, and then there are 12 sure deaths to varying degrees of violence. Oh, good old murder joke Jeff. Good murder old joke, murder Jeff. joke Jeff. What was the cat nickname? Oh, Stabby the Boss Cat. Good old Stabby the Boss Cat. <laughs> That's, those are not yeah. words. Dipper and Mabel and the Curse of the Time Pirate's Treasure was written by Stabby the Boss Cat. Illustrated. My favorite, <laughs> like, most blunt uh, descriptor of this is on the wiki where it says in trivia, 
Dipper and Mabel die repeatedly in this book, making it the deadliest <laughs> piece of Gravity Falls content. It is. It As is. I said, no one but Jeff Rowe could have written it. Yeah. Using Shelby's guide, you can only read the deaths and create like a Groundhog Day sort of sequence. Yeah. <gasps> you could narrate it in a in a sort of crypt keeper voice and make grim puns about their situation as they go. Well, <laughs> oh, this guy doesn't like it is. <laughs> so let me let me count how many deaths there are in the old west. So there is uh, how many God. ways to die in the west are there, Shelby? Shelby, how many ways are there to die in the west? Speaking of Back to the Future three, there are specifically ten ways to die. <laughs> Only ten ways to die in the West? Only ten ways to die so in the Seth West. So Seth MacFarlane was exaggerating tenfold. Hey, well, well, you know, you yes. gotta get people in seats, though. Yeah. yeah. Of course. <laughs> what? Uh, how many ways are there to die in the West? Only oh. ten. I, Why, uh, a, a, a million! <laughs> and then they watch the movie and they're like, now wait a second. Oh, it was a mil- oh, okay, I thought it was a hundred. It's a million. Oh, I don't care and can't tell numbers apart. <laughs> ah, no, I think you're right, it is a million. <laughs> All those zeros. Yeah. All those zeros. Yeah, it's too just many. one and then some quantity of zeros. My guess is one zero. Ten ways to die in the West. <laughs> that is correct. There are ten ways to die in the West. Um, fun fact about this path. If you decide to go through the train robbery and then into the mine and then into the saloon, you can actually experience a good chunk of all of the ways to live in the West oh. before getting the treasure. My favorite was definitely uh, pretending that you were the entertainment at the saloon, because then Shelby got to sing a song. Um, that was true, and we'll play that song right now. Oh, we're traveling through the country, and we're traveling back in time. A mighty fun hotel is what we aim for fun. But now we're playing for all your scary Suck it off, book! And the ending of that one is just... Yeah, the ending of staying in the West is that Blended (laughs) decides to move to the Old West and become an entertainer. (laughs) After dying in the West one of the ten ways, um, I decided that we should head to uh, Medieval Times. The restaurant? Uh, I was in the... I was in the mood for a bit of a dinner, a bit of a tournament. Yeah. And a king sent us on three potential quests, including the aforementioned Wendy one. Um, we obviously went to vanquish the dragon, though. Yes. Yes, of course. I mean, who do you think we are? Although, if we had gone with the wizard path, we would have seen Toby determined, uh, so RIP that one. Yeah, Toby is inexplicably in all three <laughs> time periods, I believe. <laughs> I think it's. I think he fell through a time pool. Yeah, he fell he in a time, fall portal, a time portal. Trying to use the public showers yeah. at the pool, he just fell into a time portal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but what we did do was we, we encountered Connor Hart the Dragon, which is a parody... Of the movie Dragon Heart, where Sean Connery voiced a dragon, but only sort of in that it's Sean Connery. <laughs> they mention he has a Scottish accent on every potential path yeah, of uh, yeah. mm-hmm. encountering him. Because we have the option of using the dragon flute to uh, defeat him that was given to us by the king. Or to go to the left. Hidden in the shadow. Mabel vanquished the dragon by talking Aww. to him. She gave it therapy. She talked it through. Mm-hmm. As a crew. Yeah. Quite possibly a reference to the fact that the inspiration for Mabel, Ariel Hirsch, is now a is now a marriage counselor. That is true. Uh, mm-hmm. Doggins, a uh, friend of the show, friend of both shows, mm-hmm. told told me that um, when him and his wife got married, um, they decided they were going to start couples counseling right away um, before problems arose, which is smart. Right. Everyone who, uh, who's listening who's thinking yeah. about getting married, do that. Very smart, yes. <laughs> but um, they looked up marriage counselors in their area and they saw Ariel Hirsch and he strongly considered it, but was like, yep. no, it'd be really, really, really weird because I've seen her as a cartoon person. Yeah, I think she needs to have like a vetting thing on her intake form. Just like, have you, do you know what Gravity Falls is? And if the answer is yes, just reject them. <laughs> I wonder if it's been the opposite problem, though. I wonder if that has cost her business because people like Dave avoiding her because they think, nah, it's going to be too weird. Which is probably true, but I mean, Gravity Falls is popular. I don't know what to... Yeah. It worked out 
great for Connor Hart. It did. Because that was how they learned they were all being manipulated by the monarchy. And I think, good thing this is a fictional book. But that was my favorite, like, <laughs> choice of talking to the dragons. Just like, I love... I love the the pacifist route. It, I love this. It's it. It so resembles good. when uh, Mabel befriends uh, an angry biker within like and twenty the, seconds. And the hand that... witch. That's true. That's true. Yeah. She gives the hand witch an extreme makeover. A candelabra. <laughs> and the book of pickup lines on the end table. That's true. And mm-hmm. so we get some some good therapy talk out of Connor Hart. We really dig into. His traumas and and his his stuff with his father. Um, he he really wanted to be an artist. He didn't want to uh, incinerate villages. He didn't want to burn and eat townsfolk. You know the countryside no. and, and all the peoples in their no. factory cottages. No, he was just a man. Well, dragon man, really. He was a dragon man. Um, well, he's really just a dragon. <laughs> So if we had gone with the wizard in the dungeon path, we would have gotten to a riddle that bizarrely resembles the the gnome riddle from the pilot, because the wizard uh, mm-hmm. gives the riddle, um, what did the wizard do at the wizard hotel or something? And they Dipper and Mabel are disagreeing on which pun is the answer. Dipper's like, oh, he called broom service. Which the uh, main conflict in the pilot that got this show picked up is that they don't agree on the answer to a riddle on a popsicle stick, yeah. Yeah. and that winds up um, saving their life at the end. Yeah. Yes. So I do wonder, I know we, last week, Alex debunked the idea that Bill's statue transformation with the bird was a reference to the pilot, but I do wonder if maybe this one was, because Jeff was was writing it and maybe was thinking about that, maybe. the pilot. Well, I mean, Jeff, I I don't know if Jeff saw the, like, do you think he saw the pilot? If he did, that's true. He came on for season two, so maybe he didn't. Yeah. Maybe it's so I think that it might just be thing. a same, yeah, same, same brain, brain kind of thing. Good thought. hire. Yeah. A good hire, yeah. Good hire. Oh, can I talk about the, the future? Yeah, a little. <laughs> a little? Well, we can't know too much, Ella. Oh, you're right. It's dangerous to know too much about your own destiny. You can also travel uh, to, is it? Uh, 2075 in this one? I think it's... 2075, yes, that is correct. Um, which is notably before the year that Blendon uh, was coming back from, right? Yes, that is correct. He didn't want to go back to a time where he might be mistaken for a time criminal? True, that's, that's true, he was good a point. convicted criminal in 2072. Yeah, you're right. Although... I will say my favorite thing is where Dipper is trying really hard. He's doing like a face off. He's pitching a face off kind of thing. And Mabel just goes, oh, no, this is easy. It just walks up to someone and is like, I would like to confess all of the crimes. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Um, so the the future aesthetically, I mean, in the in the show, what we saw in Blendon's game is very Blade Runner. And then here there's a lot of Tron uh sort of stuff. Tron, there's a lot a lot of Speed Racer combined mm-hmm. with the the race from Phantom oh, there, Menace. There are so much fan there are so many Phantom Menace jokes that some of them probably like don't even register. You have to like really <laughs> There's one here that I love that's did you just say yippee sincerely yeah, Blendon, is a line that someone Blendon says. ends up forced <laughs> into space servitude and says yippee at at the prospect of cleaning droids and Dipper's like, Did you just say yippee? <laughs> like sincerely? <laughs> so yeah, there is to really hammer home how much Jeff Rowe is just ironing out his issues with the Phantom Menace. Uh, the future timeline paths include a space race in order to win the freedom of a servant, that being Dos Huntao. Um, mm-hmm. Though, yes, the outfits uh, are based on Speed Racer, as well as Toby's yes. role in this is as Racer T, uh, which is Racer X. <laughs> Uh, Glorglax Gleeful, the, the car dealer that they have to go to to, to get a ship. The alien descendant of <laughs> Bud Gleeful. Gideon and Bud. <laughs> yeah. Um, when they are figuring out what their wager is for the space race, he rolls a probability square with red or blue sides, which is exactly what Watto does in The Phantom Menace. Uh, which <laughs> is so silly because. Yeah, Watto silly thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> But, like, you know, the yippee thing and, and the pod race are, are you know, those are, are jokes. But just having the same die... Drop from Star Wars. Having the same die that Watto used is not 
a joke or a parody, that's just hammering home how much this is a a reference, and I love it. It's so specific. I do love that the future path is the only one that actually specifically references the twist with Blendon that happens later on in the story. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, the twist that Blendon yeah. was in league with the working with the time the pirates. pirates. Yeah. 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 Um, Tony, you you betrayed us. <gasps> Wait, what now? Oh, Blendon <laughs> was working with the Time Pirates, and since you were playing Blendon, that means you betrayed us? <gasps> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, I did. I totally did. But we'll try to not to let that betrayal make a nemesis of you. Unlike some crab scientists would. Because all he really wanted was uh, was a little bit of R-E-S-P-E-C-T, because his, even his mom mm. kind of kind of bullies him, as we learn in this. Oh, and I need to play the clip of Tony as Blendon's mom. That was one of my... Oh, yes, please. So good. Take yeah. out the time trash, Blendon! Oh, yeah, that's it. Stop using your stepdad's time deodorant, Blendon! There's also a fantastic illustration in one of the paths uh, yes. of Blendon's mother. Blendon's mom has got it going on, can we say? Yeah. It's true. Although there were, there is a, a litany of references to the Phantom Menace. One of the paths, uh, when you break Dos Hun Thao, uh, or no, not, I think you're breaking somebody else out of prison. I think the space race is for Dos Hun Thao. You're, it's, um, it's Davy Time, Time Jones. Yeah. Dos Hun Thao's kind of just a, just kind of a puppy. Who just wants to be best friends with everyone. When you are breaking Davy Time Jones out of the infinitentiary, you end up going into an asteroid field, and Dipper calculates the odds of surviving the asteroid field, and Mabel says not to tell her the odds. What's that from? Did you get it? No, I don't I don't actually get it. I've only seen that movie once. Well, it's a reference to the uh Ocarina of Time of movies. Yeah, okay, that one's from Empire. Okay, I believe you. I saw Empire on a VHS tape I rented from the library like 15 years ago. Gotcha. So yeah. Mm. have not seen it since. There were still VHSs 15 years ago? That's right, 15 years ago. Maybe it was more than 15 years ago. I can't I process I think it might it. have been more than 15 years ago. Time means nothing. Also, the, the library um, did not get rid of their VHSs and had started collecting DVDs when those became a thing and started collecting VHSs when the library opened. So there was just a wider selection. So the copious amounts of Back to the Future references are all over the book. But in the future path, you get your dose of Star Wars references, too. Star Wars? And those are the only times I've ever heard anyone reference Star Wars, I think. I think so. It's true. Tony, you're, I think... you're, st- I, have you guys, li- Ella, have you listened to Tony's Star Wars episode? I really want to. I still, I still have to check that one out. <laughs> yeah. A, a while back for Star Wars Day this year, May the 4th, uh, I, I decided to do an episode that I've actually been wanting to do for a while where we review, we cover the original Star Wars 1977, A New Hope, but we do it as though we all live in an alternate timeline where, where the it, movie completely flopped uh, and George Lucas it never worked again. It came out as it is, but it flopped when it was released in 1977. So it only exists as this, the entirety of the Star Wars universe is just this one obscure movie that no one's seen. And we're reviewing it. We're reviewing it as though it's unidentified flying off. That's amazing. So it's just this crazy, you know, movie from decades ago. So like you're in the you're in like the yesterday verse where I where... like this multiverse. Yeah. Like yeah and in the universe of the podcast, the reason that it's on Disney Plus is because of the Fox acquisition. Oh uh, yeah. Of course. Right, exactly. They just acquired it and they might as well slap it on their platform for you know Yeah, I guess so. It's free content, <laughs> basically. Uh when you participate in the See, it's physically painful for me not to say pod race. I have to say s- the space race. Well, we pot we're podcasting about the space race. So it's a space race pod. Um it's the it's the zoom zoom bleep blop thunder. Oh, you're right because yeah. the time baby named it, which also explains why Globnar is called Globnar now that I think about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, actually. Oh. Oh! Yeah. The time baby named it. <laughs> the weird stuff that comes out of Matt Chapman and uh, Jeff Rowe's mouth is kind of enough like baby speech yeah. that they could be and like, we maybe are. They're... <laughs> we're recording via Zoom Zoom right now. We are. Now this, guys, is podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> now this is pod. Ella and I say that to each other, just text that to each other, maybe once a month at the minimum. And now it's the most appropriate to say. <laughs> well, well, you got to say it like Jake Lloyd, though, and go, now, now this, this is, is podcasting. podcasting. Don't worry, I'll get you the Turbo Man. Is uh, is Jingle all the way on Disney Plus? <gasps> is it? Uh, it it was. I don't no. know if it still is. Let me let me quickly check. Now, 
Jingle All the Way was on Disney Plus for a while. Maybe it'll be back this this holiday mm-hmm. season. But you know what is on Disney Plus? Jingle All the Way Two oh, with, with Larry, Larry the, the Cable, cable guy. guy. Yeah, finally, that is on j- the ri- the first one is not the second one. So is. make sure to yes. not get Ella and I on your podcast ten times. Then, oh, Tony. God. <laughs> well, hang on if. If Jingle All the Way isn't on streaming, then I guess I have to find it on physical media, but there's only one left in all of the city! I have to get it before Sinbad does! <laughs> because Sinbad loves his performance in that movie so much that he just buys up every single cop! Oh, yes. There are three possible ways to get to the um, the one true ending. In the Old West, it is through the outlaw path. Which we failed to do, <laughs> We failed to do. We hit the wrong one. We hit the wrong ending for that one. Um, in the medieval path, it's through the dragon path. And in the 2075, it's through the, um, through the space race path. And like I said, they all kind of circle back to that one path that should get you back on track to get to the one true ending. The final path, uh, Blendon, Dipper, and Mabel go through the time stream. They find a door with a Jolly Roger on it. They open it up, land in the sand. Mabel pulls a crab out of her hair and... <laughs> Whoa. Oh, uh... Who mentioned my sweet, precious little baby? Well, folks, it appears that uh, Agatha Vile, the great-granddaughter of renowned crab scientist Dr. Vile, has just uh, chainsawed her way into uh, this podcast. Welcome, Agatha. Welcome! I stole from my roommate success! for the second time! <laughs> well done! Well, uh, I guess you were summoned by the mention of, of a crab, I assume. Yeah, it said Mabel pulled a giant crab out of her hair. Was that was that giant crab one of yours? See, the thing is... Well. Yeah, well. Some of these experiments are part of a specific region. If it, uh-huh. So, Oregon, I'm not quite familiar with. Well, this is there actually is not in, in Oregon. This to... is in uh, in the time stream. Yeah, this actually have you isn't ever really... launched a it's... giant crab? Oh, in... then, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, oh, so, you, so why did you launch it. a giant crab into the time I was going to say, stream? are you incorporating time travel into your crab experiments now? Uh, of course. What? Okay. Yeah, that does seem. <laughs> you're, right, no, you're right. Logical next yeah. step. Logical next step. It was so nice yeah. of you to come by and see us. I, I, uh, <laughs> do you want some like uh, Irish soda bread or something? Oh, I haven't had Irish soda bread in years. Please, I would love some. I don't know if you all know this, but Agatha is actually my arch nemesis. Oh, I um, never mm-hmm. asked for an arch nemesis. She just sort of. Sorry, I didn't realize this is, is kind of awkward Tony, then, isn't it? Tony, what? Tony, what? Tony, what? Tony, what? Tony, what? Bitch. See, this is what I'm talking about. You know, yeah. I, I, what sorry, I, I didn't. I didn't realize you'd be creating <laughs> such an awkward, you know, social situation. I, I did nothing to deserve this. We can't get enough of her, personally. Yeah. Like, oh, well, it, it, I, I always feel it ain't a party <laughs> until Agatha and Cherry and several dozen crab experiments show up. Yes. Well, she's currently asleep now, so there can't be that much party. A silent disco, then. Ooh, that sounds like fun. She has made some of my episodes more interesting. I'll give you that, but. Um, but interesting episodes are harder to edit because they take longer. <laughs> so, oh, that would explain everything about our podcast. Mm. Is that why she's your nemesis? She has made the uh, the edits. You more ever difficult? noticed how any episode I'm in, he's always late. I mean, it hasn't it, it hasn't helped. I'll give it that much. But but she's mainly. I, I mean, she decided that we were arch nemeses long before mm-hmm. I even... St- I, well, well, not before I even started the podcast, but before she mm-hmm. was on it, certainly. I see. Was it hate at first sight, then, Agatha? It was a soul bond. Something like that. My roommate was a fan of his for a long time. I didn't care. And then he covered the episode and made a mockery of my great-grandfather's experiments. I didn't know Dr. Vile was a real person, and I, I apologize for that. So if you're if you're interested in learning more about uh, Agatha's great-grandfather, um, there is actually a documentary uh, about him on Disney+. Plus. Now, interestingly, there seems to be an error on the app, and it's listed as Season 3, Episode 3 of the Little Mermaid animated series. Yeah, it should, it should be under the Nat Geo section. It's called Island of Fear. It left on a cliffhanger. And there was supposed to be a fourth season. Mm. They had all the villains of that series coming together to try to take over Atlantis, and that never happened. Oh, is that why you're? 
working with time travel, then? Are you- oh! It's all coming together! You know how it took 25 years for Twin Peaks to get a third season? For that gum we like to get come back in style? Yes, I recall. Little Mermaid The Return? Exactly. See... David Lynch has connections. I'm trying to get those connections through time travel. It's been 28 years since the Little Mermaid series was canceled, Agatha. It's what? What? It's been it's what? been 20. Take a butt. Oh, Agatha, God damn it. Agatha, it's been 28 years since the Little Mermaid series was canceled. I I feel like the ship has sailed and sunk. And now Ariel's investigating that ship under the sea, and then a shark's gonna attack her and flout. I recall that actually. From the documentary The Little Mermaid. So you're not trying to travel back to when the series uh, was canceled. You're just traveling back like two years or so to where a reboot will will be in the right uh, zone to come out. You're not traveling. <laughs> we'll have two years. We'll see. The 30-year cycle. They made a direct-to-video sequel and a direct-to-video prequel to The Little Mermaid, and neither of them mentioned Dr. Vile. Who gives a shit about that? I, 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 I just feel like it might be time to let this go, Agatha. He has his own villain Wikipedia page! I mean, we had, you know, they, they they went for Ursula's sister. What about Dr. Vile's great granddaughter? Hello? Hello, Disney. I wasn't invited to be on Descendants. Uh, what? That's a crime, I think. Oh, there's only one episode. It doesn't count, even though Yzma somehow was able to procreate. What about, were you not asked to no Once Upon a Time representation? No. I kind of stopped watching that once Frozen came, was introduced, and, uh... It is famously unwatchable, so that... That affects a, a lot listen, of the viewers. Listen, here's the thing about villains. We love cheese. I mean, I mean, Yzma wanted cheese. I know that. Yz- Yzma wanted cheese, but Kuzco was like, cheese me no likey, and that was the c- comical situation. That's I recall right. that, yes. From the documentary, The Emperor's New Groove. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're all documentaries. I mean, depending on who you view as the villain of that piece. Oh, yeah. That's true. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. could be oh, a lactose intolerant it, villain, I mean, yeah. I, no, it's Kuzco. It Let's is. be real here. It's Kuzco. Kuzco. Kuzco is the villain. Yes. Excuse me, David Spade, Eartha Kitt. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? That's a fantastic and point. She had a threesome with, uh, who is it, James Dean and someone else, I don't remember. She did? Yep. The goat. I don't know what else to tell you. Well, she was a cat, Charlie. She was a cat. Before we let you go, because uh, we know you have to get straight to crab experiment in r- bright and early in the morning. Also, I think my roommate is after me because I stole a chainsaw a second time. Okay, and well I then. Tied her up during that one yeah. live stream and she was not happy. Yeah. But before we let you go, what is hashtag free Agatha? <laughs> so, I was trying to defend my friends. I have, for some reason, I don't know why, but I welcome it lovingly. I have a lot of People from the trans community that follow me. Uh, me too, although I probably know the reason why. <laughs> Honestly, Agatha, that, that tracks to me. I, and there are people being very awful, posting hateful memes and messages, celebrating the suicide rates, calling them just disgusting things. And I was standing up for them because... Like any good mad scientist know, should, honestly. Well, also, I'm using my, I am cisgender, and I'm using that privilege to try to stand uh, up. Oh, yeah. Them. I understand my privilege, and I'm trying we to use it as a weapon, that. if that makes any sense. And we love weapons. Mm-hmm. You use anything as a weapon. It's really fun. Do you use the crabs as a weapon? Uh, not in this case. They're not quite ready yet to crawl up inside the orifices of trans Oh, things. that's, that's a different experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a different type of crabs, though. Oh, that's ah, right. Da, 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 da. Good night, everybody. So Agatha is banned from Twitter. Because they figured out the algorithm. If I repeat a word, like, you have the memory of a goldfish. Well, you have to repeat you have a memory of a goldfish or they'll forget. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the catch-22. Yeah. That's how they get you. With the mass reporting, some of them even posted links to search pages that included every tweet of whatever word they searched. It was creepy. Yeah. And they reported it, mass reported it, and it was labeled as hate speech and abuse. Now, I reported them for targeted harassment because, again, very creepy what they were doing. And uh, last time I checked... 
Their accounts are still available. I even sent Tony a couple of links, along with several pictures of my middle finger. But he, it's just a thing that we do every day. You're, th- that's a very generous use of the word we there, Agatha. <laughs> <laughs> was, was one not, not enough for Tony to get the gist? Or? You have a quota every day. So everyone, go follow Vile Agatha on Twitter, at Vile Agatha. Uh, and a celebrate the return. Get it? I threw it back to the Twin Peaks thing. Yes, you did. This is the fourth podcast you've been on, right? You were on Channel KRT, yes. then Escape from Vault Disney, and then well, Emperor's uh, Emperor's uh, new podcast. Emperor's new right? podcast was my first one, and I remember that because oh! Cherry was several months Aww. old, and then when I returned, she was at least a year old. So it was a nice little time capsule. Time capsule. We love time capsules. We do. If you'd like to hear to hear more of uh, Agatha, uh, mainly you can check out, uh, well, presumably her secret lab conducting her uh, crab experiments. But you could also listen to the Escape from Vault Disney podcast, uh, which is, of course, hosted by Tony Goldmark. And you can find that on PipeDreamPodcast.com. So uh, thank you, Agatha, for generously uh, donating your time and, and chainsawing our trees oh, and our walls. and uh, contractors. They're crabs with uh, little yellow working hats helmets that's adorable <gasps> oh they're very yes! adorable and oh, adorable. They're oh good are they union of course they're union listen i may be a villain okay, okay. Not yeah a monster. good i mean clearly you bully trans folks so you're not no villainy is a career for you it is of not... course exactly you're a wonderful person <laughs> from my experience oh, thank uh, you, you so don't much. text me pictures of you. i have no idea what your middle finger looks like actually uh, it's it's nothing special it's it looks like a middle finger. Thank you for doing all this. This was very sweet and very nice of you. I very, I greatly appreciate. Oh, it. we we are any time, Agatha. So good to finally have you on. Our door is always open. Me, uh, time capsule and no spoiler book club. S Sue, time capsule and book. Club. If you want to hear her on Escape from Vault Disney, she barged into the episodes we did on Unidentified Flying Oddball, The Scream Team, and The Luck of the Irish. So and you recently posted out. an entire duel between Agatha and David Gansel, yes. one of our previous yeah, she's guests. In a, she's in a few minisodes thank as well. God, yeah. because, uh... <laughs> during that. All right, thank you so much for stopping by. No, thank you very much. Good night, Agatha. Good night, and good luck, everyone. So yeah, then there's the twist that Blendon Blandon was working with the Time Pirates all along, but um, he teams up with them, they defeat the Time Pirates, Dipper and Mabel take the treasure home, decide its power and temptation is too great, and bury it in the woods. Where it is still buried! Somewhere! Oh wait, no, Bradley dug it up. Shoot. Every time. Every time! Bradley! Nah, Bradley! Every time time. Wait, is Bradley the nemesis of this podcast? Is Bradley the curse of the Time Pirates treasure? <gasps> Bradley! Also known as the curse of the Time Pirates treasure. We'll we'll have our grand battle with you one day, but as for right now, I would love it if uh, we took this conversation over on to the Hall of Conspiracies. Ooh. Yeah, let's do that. With our new intro voiced by Alex Hirsch. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Ladies and gentlemen, right this way to the Hall of Conspiracies. So if you choose uh, for Mabel to drive in the space race, the reader eventually gets the option to jump into a time vortex. Now, according to Blendon Blandon, no one knows what happens inside one. This leads us to a mysterious cryptogram. Translates in Caesar Cipher to, Shapes and colors whiz past. Time itself seems to slow to a crawl. Blendon screams. Blendon, can you scream real quick? Tony? Oh. Ah! Where are they going? <laughs> www.disneyxt.com slash a wrong turn. So uh, if you're listening, don't rush to go to that because it doesn't exist. <laughs> yes, that URL is now defunct. It just links back to a generic Disney XD Gravity Falls page. But this is generally regarded as what leads to the canon secret that Alex uh, alluded to, though he never confirmed that. I, right? I still think it's the farmer whose oh, yeah, family it's, it's died the, it's the, from the witchcraft. Farmer Sprott lore that uh, something yeah. you did in the past to Sprott's ancestors created a family fear of witches. But uh, yeah, this page 
feels like it's written by Alex. The, yeah, the, the phrasing right. feels more Alex mm-hmm. than Brett. I mean, Jeff. Um, the Gravity Falls fans have graciously archived the uh, page that was on the Disney XD site because it was just an image file. And every single word of it will be useful for fan theories from this point on. So uh, without further ado, here is the entire wrong turn page. Shapes and colors whiz past as Dipper and Mabel's space racer warps through hyperspace. The twins clutch each other and scream as a kaleidoscopic explosion of unnatural colors and sounds swirls around them. Time stops, and all at once they find their space racer hovering in a strangely glittering and mysterious milky white void. Blendon? Blendon! Calls Mabel into the intercom, but the intercom is dead. Where are we? Muses Dipper. Dipper's question is answered by a strange, otherworldly voice that seems to ebb and flow like whale song from the ether. You are in the time and space between time and space, the voice says, echoing. Come on, climb out of that space racer. I have a very nice beanbag chair. Seeing the beanbag chair hovering nearby, Dipper and Mabel exit their space racer and climb onto it. It's infinitely comfortable. Who are you? Asks Mabel. I am the Asholot. But enough about me. You've managed to find me, so you get one question apiece. Don't waste it. Says the Asholot. What are you, like a salamander? Asks Mabel. I am the Asholot. Replies the Asholot. And that was your question. How about you, boy? The Asholot stares at Dipper. Dipper thinks a moment. What do you know about Bill Cipher? The Asholot ponders the question. Then his eyes begin to glow, and he speaks. Sixty degrees that come in threes, watches within birch trees. Saw his own dimension burn, misses home and can't return. Says he's happy. He's a liar. Blame the arson for the fire. If he wants to shirk the blame, he'll have to invoke my name. One way to absolve his crime, a different form, a different time. The twins stare blankly. What the heck does that mean? Asks Dipper. Shh! It's freeform poetry! Says Mabel. I thought it was beautiful. Maybe a little wordy. The Asholot laughs. You won't remember me tomorrow, but it was my genuine pleasure to meet you. Um... Mabel! And my name's Dipper. No. It isn't. Says the Asholot with a smile. There's a blinding white flash of light, and the day begins again, as if nothing ever happened. Go to page one to restart the story. Uh, so... That's, uh, that's the secret page. And mm. thank you to Tia from the YouTube channel Strange Aeons. Uh, what you might not know is his name is Strange. Uh, for voicing the Asholote for us. Yeah, it was awesome. Oh, by the way, we know how to pronounce uh, Asholote now. <laughs> yeah, we didn't when we covered uh, Weird Beginning but now 3 we do. and covered the the backwards message um, yes. where Bill says... <laughs> Uh, is the last thing that Bill Cipher ever said. When we covered that on the podcast, we knew that it is not pronounced like ask a lot of, and that um, enough had been uncovered about the Nahutl language of the Aztec people that we can now say with pretty clear certainty that their word for water dog is a showload. And it's got this, uh, I'll link a video in the, the description for a pronunciation guide. It's got this kind of click toward the end where you're not quite pronouncing the L, but you're beginning to pronounce the L. Like, a sholot. Like, there's this little hint of a... Almost Russian. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's that's kind of a big lore drop there about Bill and... Uh... Yes, so the Asholot says, um, he'll have to invoke my name, and that seems to pertain to Bill saying, I invoke the ancient power that I may return, and spelling the Asholot's name. Um, um, the segment also ends with the Asholot telling the twins that they won't remember this tomorrow, so it kind of puts it in this, like, pocket dimension of canon, where, like, it could happen, you know, you could consider that it happened, but maybe if it if it didn't, then it didn't, and it's not gonna, it, yeah. you know. Mm, pocket canon. It's very tasty. Yes. And technically, if you do the future one first and go through this ending, you can do, like, 
<laughs> Shelby, have you planned out the longest possible way to read this book? I went crazy today doing All this. All right, Shelby, how can you waste the absolute most <laughs> amount of time reading Dipper and Mabel and the Curse of the Time Pirate's Treasure? Beyond reading the title. Yes, of course. So the longest path is to do the future, go through the prison, like the correct path in that, which is clock, dress up as guards, join the fight. And then that leads into the race, which you choose the racer, not getting scammed by um, ye, ye future gleeful. <laughs> they still uh, say ye. <laughs> of course. Of course. Uh, and then you choose morality and then shortcut because the morality one leads back to shortcut, much like the choosing not vengeance leads back to vengeance. Because oh, interesting. there's only I one didn't know real that. option. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you choose jump. You choose the Asholote. And then you go back to the Old West, you do the train, you do the write-up, you block, Mabel talks, you decline, you do the mine, uh, you don't trust him, you do the mine cart, you open the treasure, you go to the outlaw, uh -huh. you do the sh cards, you shoot, you shoot the fat blaster, you do the time stream, the fight, not greedy, there you go. It's like So you can't, you, you can't do the medieval one as well. So... Shelby, the, you realize you have invented the exact opposite of a speed run. Yes. The speed <laughs> so run the, is saying <laughs> decline. So if you start by going to 2075, then the future was in the past. Yes. Onwards, Aoshima. <laughs> there, the, uh, the Asholot also hints, uh, further at the idea that Dipper, uh, is not Dipper's birth name by saying, no, it isn't. In Which is to... interesting, because when Alex tweeted that there was one big canon thing, everybody was guessing it was going to be Dipper's name. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And that technically we did get it the same day because it is in the journal. Spoilers. That's right. That's right. Wait for More uh... on that, uh, next podcast. So, uh, this spawned a great deal of fan theories because it is, more elaboration on the last thing the main villain of exactly. the show ever said. But the most notable above all uh, is a theory that has gone down in the fandom terminology as same coin theory. This uh, was originated by Dubs D Dubs on Tumblr, and we are going to read that out now. A Time Pirates theory. Spoilers. Now, same coin. AKA, Stan is not what he seems. Again. I have a theory based on the secret page of the new Time Pirates book, the one with the uh, Sholo that Bill invokes in the finale for the show, who gives Dipper and Mabel some very interesting information about our favorite floating triangle and the terms of his resurrection. Basically, I have a cool idea about how Bill is going to come back. Or should I say, came back. I would love to hear what y'all think. Also, a big thanks to everyone I rambled about this spoiler to, most of whom I ended up tagging below, eh? As well as Ford Tato for walking me through the general spoiler theory post etiquette. Hey, Ford Tato! Ford Tato's in our Discord. Hey! Shout out to listener Ford Tato. Yeah. I'm going to start with my evidence first because it is kind of a really crazy theory, puts on tinfoil hat. First of all, here is the actual page of spoilers. And then they uh, show the Ashola page that we just read. There are several things in here that I found interesting. First, the terms of Bill's resurrection. He'll have to invoke my name, one way to absolve his crime, a different form, a different time. One way to absolve his crime. Bill is allowed to return as a way to redeem himself for his actions. Read trying to end a world, whether that is his world or the GF world is up for interpretation. So in Bill's new existence, he will be doing something that will make up for his crimes. But what can he do in order to make up for something as big as destroying dimensions and starting Weird Mageddon? A different form. Bill will be returning not as a floating triangle, not as a dream demon, not as anything he was before. And somehow I don't think this is just referring to a stone statue. So what will he be? A different time. And now it gets interesting because the emphasis is odd. There's two possibilities here. The first is that he came back in the future. The thing is, Bill isn't returning immediately. We know that. So if he does make a return chronologically, no matter what, he'll be coming back in the future. It's generally assumed, and it doesn't really have an effect on Gravity Falls canon as we know it. So 
why would Alex mention Bill's future redemption arc? For post-canon fic and shenanigans? Possibly. But I had a different idea. What if Bill comes back in the past? We know time has no meaning for Bill and creatures like him, like the Asholote. This way, Bill's return and redemption does have a confluence with the events of the show as we know it. And I know this part is a bit weak, but just accept that he could come back in the past. The big question now is, if Bill came back in a different form to absolve his crimes, where is he now? This leads on to my next point of interest. Mrs. Holman can't return, says he's happy, he's a liar. I found these two bits of description familiar. Very, very familiar. In fact, without context, I would say those two lines describe someone else entirely. Mrs. Holm and Can't Return, and then it shows two images of um, Stanley living out of his car and Stanley being kicked out of his family's house. Says he's happy, he's a liar. Um, that is near identical to a line in the 3DS game uh, Legend of the Gnome Gemulates where Candy's... <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's your. <laughs> That's my Agatha Vial. <laughs> <laughs> That's your nemesis. Is a is Ubisoft. So where Candy Chu says your uncle acts happy, but he is actually sad. Then comes the fire motifs. Saw his own dimension burn. Blame the arson for the fire. Or maybe the question should be, who is he now? The only thing that could make up for trying to end the world for the most selfish of reasons. Saving it for the most selfless of reasons. What is Bill when he isn't a triangle or a demon? The best con man in the world. We have the many, many Stan and Bill parallels we've seen throughout the show. For the sake of length, I'll briefly mention the highlights. We have the Stan is not what he seems cipher with the emphasis on the what... We can accept the cipher as just being given by Alex Hirsch, but with the existence of the fourth wall breaking a Sholote, it's freeform poetry, seems pretty similar to the end of episode ciphers, huh? Oh, that's, yeah, because they're all written in, as poems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We might have an in-universe explanation for the cipher as well, and would so definitely know this information, which is something Bill, or any other entity in Gravity Falls verse, would not know. We know that Bill's laughter in the last Mabel Corn sw shifts to Stan's cackling, and for blank is not what he seems. In the original show in which it appears, Twin Peaks, the phrase refers to the show's main villain, both credits to at Ren Morris. I don't understand Twin Peaks enough. The phrases the owls are not what they seem. Are the owls related to Bob? Killer Bob? I don't, I did not process that. I've never seen Twin Peaks. That's why you I'm Agatha's best friend and you Ah, gotcha. You're the nemesis. Um I like this so far. I'm not I'm not familiar with this one. Oh interesting. Oh wow, okay, cool. Uh there's the similarity in dress and speech, by gold, eeny meeny miny you, and even the way Bill and Stan both immediately like Mabel for her weirdness and takes every opportunity to mess with Dipper. There's how Bill and Stan are grouped together in every piece of merchandise, and how Alex Hirsch offers us these two knuckleheads together at last. Knuckleheads? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Phil Brick Pines' favorite thing to call his son. And then there's the fact that over the course of those 30 years, Bill never made a deal with Stan. Even when Stan was desperate and would have taken any deal. Even when Bill could have gained enormously. It doesn't make sense that Bill wouldn't seize the opportunity unless there's something that would have the power to protect Stan from outside meddling, the Asholot. And didn't Stan keep an Asholot as a pet in the fish tank in the shack, which mysteriously disappeared in the inconveniencing, and the absence is highlighted throughout the rest of the series, even being shown in the finale. And in the season finale, Bill finally gets access to Stan's mind, meaning that the protection was lost. Mm. In addition, we now have the clues in the cipher hunt to find the Bill statue. First, with the phone calls in Stan's voice and identity, then the fill brick written in invisible ink behind every Stan buck in bag. Not to mention, now a grunkle is missing. Stan is involved some way, somehow. Coincidence? In a show like Gravity Falls? I think not! <laughs> yes! Thank, <laughs> thank you! you. <laughs> In short, my theory, or 
crazy guess is in some way or another, Stan is Bill. <gasps> or rather, he was at some point and has grown to be much, much more. Some way, somehow. Maybe Bill's hitching a ride and auditing the college class of humanity, or maybe Stan is just a clean slate who made different choices. I can already see the question now. Is this heading towards an edgy, Bill possesses Stan and makes the Pines family miserable again idea? Uh, No offense, by the way, for anyone who's read my writing, you know how much of a sucker I am for that trope, but no, just the opposite. See, this is Bill's redemption. He returned in a completely different form, in a completely different time, for the purpose of absolving his crimes with, and we can be pretty sure about this, no memories of his past existence, at least until the stable time loop closes. Not to mention, in his new identity, Bill really can make up for the specific people that he has hurt the most. Stan had plenty of opportunity to go off the rails over the course of his life, from the 10 years as a criminal and con man, to his 30 years of pretending to be his brother, even to the deal that Bill offers him. Fame, riches, the galaxy. He is put into the same situation Bill presumably once was. The earlier parallels of Mrs. Home and says he's happy he's a liar. And he's all set up to make Bill's mistakes. But he doesn't. He gives up power and fame and money, all for the sake of his family and his home. He destroys the original Bill, sacrifices himself, and saves the world completely selflessly. Because the thing is, uh, Bill's crime isn't weird Weirdmageddon. Not exactly. His real crime is choosing power over his family and causing the destruction of his home dimension and everyone he knows. But Stan, put in the same situation under the same circumstances, chooses his family instead. That is how Bill absolves his crimes. Everything I've ever done, it was for this family! Skylar! In return, Stan gets to go back home and be with his family. He doesn't have to lie about being happy anymore. He's going to live a long, long life, um, how long depends on your interpretation, and spend every day of it loved by and loving his family. It fits with the show's whole theme of family and redemption, and Bill's getting out of the experience fundamentally changed if he even gets out at all. Stan has already earned his own happy ending, and he's keeping it. And the cipher hunt... To keep with the optimistic approach, maybe the whole family's working together to root out Bill Cultus a a la at the Snadger's post, using Stan's returning memories following the closing of the time loop. After all, Stan does seem more like he's reading from Mabel's cue cards than actual possession, right? Um, so that, the theories about how this relates to the cipher hunt relates to, uh, what we talked about, uh, last time, where people were actually theorizing about what the cipher hunt was implying for the characters, mm. like, post-series. Yes. Um, but yeah, this, so this massively influential theory was dubbed same coin theory as, you know, the idea that Bill and Stan are two sides of the same coin. And it really, it made the rounds, you know? It went on to the Veilska bomb. I believe even, uh, Matthew Pathew made a theory, made a <laughs> video, uh, highlighting the theory. Which, and it's just a theory. Uh, Bill, th- no, I, I, I don't know if he gave credit or not, which, you know, sucks, but, uh, we're giving credit now, so thank you, Dubs D Dubs, for this very thought provoking theory. But they also posted an addendum clarifying, I'm just gonna sum it up, uh, quote, I don't wanna take away Stan's choices or his agency or diminish his character arc in any way. In fact, I want to emphasize his free will because he makes the decision to be good and kind and loving despite any and all of the external cosmic factors that might be going on. In this theory, Exactly how much of him is Bill is up to interpretation, but regardless of the answer to that question, the important thing is that Stanley Pines is more than Bill Cipher. While the evidence in the Ashola page and in the show exist, there's a dozen hundred directions they can point to, and it doesn't and shouldn't have to be the one that hurts. And I adore that that little addendum, and I adore the whole theory and the whole like story that it tells. This is really why I love the vastness of the Gravity Falls theories and fandom, because that's such an interesting angle 
an interesting character perspective where like it's it's like reading mm-hmm. all of these theories that um will never be debunked or confirmed is like this series branches off into several paths and we have to select our our own uh <gasps> choose venture so to speak exactly and the and it, none of them have to be again this goes back to what i was saying about canon like none of these have to be like oh i think this is correct because the fact is <laughs> because the characters actually aren't real. <laughs> yeah, it's all a made-up story. It's all a made-up story, and you can cho- select your own choose venture and find like what connects the most to you from a storytelling perspective, and it puts that power in your hands to to you know to write these characters. Maybe the real fan theory was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> You're right. Just kidding. It was Labam. Of course, it was Labam. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. It had to be Labam. How I learned to stop worrying and love Labam. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I do think it's interesting that when we were talking with Alex, he did specifically say that those parallels in lines are just the way that he writes a jerk. But it's interesting to me that there comes a point where the um, the series itself, once it's put out into the world, evolves past what the creator Yeah, it doesn't belong made. to him anymore. It doesn't belong yeah. to him necessarily anymore. And I remember Alex also talking about, like, he said, like, yes, that is just parallel thinking in my own writing, but he also added, like, but I don't want to say that too often because I don't want to ruin the fun of the speculation. It's really a matter of death of the author of the journals, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and people theorized about that, too. Um, and uh, a competing theory uh, is that Bill was reincarnated. As Toby determined. W- yes, no, that would have been good. <laughs> a competing theory was posted to the subreddit by John Knight 648 saying that... Uh, Bill might have been reincarnated slash resurrected into Emperor Snorkshnog from the future path, who is an emperor with a one yellow glowing eye. Yeah, he he's the, uh, a Do- Dos Hunthau is the servant of this emperor. That is who they have to free him from in the space race. In a very Mad Maxian style. I, yeah, I was thinking a very job of the Huttian as well. Yeah, a little, a little bit of both. A Same vibe. Both. Yeah. Jabba the Max. It's a job, 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 job hut. It's the job, job, job. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the the emperor does have the glowing eye, much like uh, much like Bill's. It did say a different time, and a different a different form. So what about uh what about what about a different form called uh called s- 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 Snorkschnog? <laughs> yes, but what is what is Snorkschnog's? character what what do they do on the story circle <laughs> yeah it does sound like a justin Roiland thing <laughs> yeah so they said uh if the eshalot is right then bill might be reincarnated or resurrected as a different form and might conquer a planet which is not well no it is earth it's the future yeah. earth as we know it yeah so that that about uh sums up the response to that that bonus page which thankfully still exists it's I should. I would suggest that we should also probably upload it somewhere. Right. Just as yeah. A for sure. Uh, it's it's wild to me how many of these secrets are contained on URLs that no longer because yeah. this isn't even the first time yeah. that we've encountered this. I believe the uh, the guide to mystery and nonstop fun had a had a similar issue. It did that as well. That is correct. Yeah. Disney does not like keeping these pages up for very long. No, and it's also just like we were talking about with Jingle All the Way. Uh, you know, digital media. And and streaming and all that is you know is ephemeral. It's it could go away at any moment, um, which is kind of terrifying. So yeah. preserve stuff, y'all. <laughs> yeah, you can be a curator of you your can. own or a docent. And speaking of docents, thank you for taking two consecutive nights out of your life to spend time with Thanks. us, Tony. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. Ah, uh, no problem. I just this just means I gotta. Pull a few all-nighters getting this week's oh, Escape no. from Vault Disney episode edited. Oops. But that's okay. So if you're curious why that episode was late, that was us. That was our fault. We did well, that. we had um, Agatha on our podcast, and that's why your podcast is late. Oh, you're right. Whenever yes. Agatha shows up, the episode will be late, and that yep. that just proves the truism. Tradition. 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 Exactly. <laughs> So before we wrap up today, we have a bit of fan mail and a correction regarding our Cypher Hunt episode. This is from Mike. I finally found time to listen to your entire podcast featuring Alex Hirsch, Jason Ritter, and yourselves discussing the Cypher Hunt. First, 
let me congratulate you on a highly entertaining and informative episode. Oh, thank, thank you, you. Mike. Thank you too. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. It was mostly Shelby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried my best. I decided to write because of my involvement with the hunt, particularly the final cipher and to affirm some details while correcting a couple of small ones. Thank you. I am running is funny, which is still my Twitter handle, to which I added a Reddit account under the same name, long since abandoned, specifically for the cipher hunt. I solved the Polybius cipher. <gasps> yes! <gasps> Folks, we have the gotten man, an email mystery. from the solver of the, the hardest, cipher. The hardest puzzle in the entire cipher. Yes! Oh my gosh! Uh, Mike continues, While it warmed my heart to hear Alex say I didn't take credit for it, and for you to say it was admirable for me to do it anonymously, that's not entirely true. A couple of weeks after the hunt ended, I posted a full story on my work site, uh, link in the description, of how I discovered Gravity Falls, followed the hunt, and found myself in a position to determine Bill's resting place. Alex is right about the hunt entering the larger world of cryptanalysis. I had been published several times, I appreciate that spelling, <laughs> on code breaking, but I labored in vain along with everyone else until Alex gave us the Polybius clue. I then labored further in vain, trying to reconstruct the square, which I ultimately decided was too difficult for two reasons. Number one, most Polybius ciphers are solved because the analyst has a large amount of material to work with. Our sum total was 11 letters. And number two, while you can construct a simple Polybius square in alphabetical order, which it turned out that's what was done, with A, B, C, D, E being the number combinations, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, with F then being 2, 1, etc., you can vastly complicate matters by starting with a keyword. Let's say it's pines. In that case, P would be 1, 1, and the letter I would be 1, 2. You would continue and then put the remaining letters in order. Uh, so in that way, it is kind of similar to how Visionaire works. Yes. yes. Well, Alex could have used a keyword or phrase that was 10 letters long or 20, which would have been almost an entirely scrambled alphabet, how to even account for that? I'll just add an addendum to your addendum saying Ian Worrell could have used a keyword or phrase. So I went to a shortcut that codebreakers often have used throughout history, guessing at the possibilities and seeing if they hold up. Just like Alan Turing surmising the phrase Heil Hitler would appear in a secret German messages during World War II. Yikes. Yikes. That is smart, though. If it is an encoded message and you have that many letters. They they do love saying that. Yeah, for, they, they, for they, there's reason. that scene in Jojo Rabbit where <laughs> they all have to. Yeah, they all they all. Yeah, and it goes yeah. on for like like an entire yeah. minute of everyone in the room saying Heil Hitler to each other. Yeah. Since the final message was only 11 letters and it needed to point to a location, it wasn't unreasonable to assume that the last two letters were O-R for Oregon. I did also try spelling out the entire word Oregon, but it has two O's four letters apart, and that didn't coincide with ciphertext. The solution proceeded as I described on the Reddit and Twitter posts, but there is one part of it mentioned on YouTube and on your podcast that's a little off. I didn't go down a list of 200-some-odd Oregon towns to find it. That's, that's nuts. But in our defense, the Gravity Falls fandom is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did kind of cover this. Uh, but yeah, if OR were the last two letters, then letters 7 and 8 were also OR, and the first letter was also R. If the first letter were R, then the doubled letters 2 and 3 had to be a vowel. S almost certainly E. Put it all together and you get RE OR OR. I just checked Google search to see if this still works, and it does. Type a space in the search bar, and then the full word Oregon. Click back to the beginning before the space, and then start typing R, then E, then another E, and guess what? The first suggestion by Google is Reedsport. Whoa, that's awesome! Using the power of a creepy search yeah. engine. That's 
Amazing. <laughs> I felt pretty confident I had solved the cipher, but frankly, that wasn't enough. I relied on the wisdom of crowds and posted my solution, hoping that someone could narrow it down from an entire town to an exact location. Someone then printed out and trimmed the X marks the spot portion of the map to lay it against various points of Reedsport on Google Maps. <laughs> Again, exploiting the creepiness of Google. Yes. Yeah. The rest is history. Uh, that part does blow my mind, though. The, yes. The map tracing. Oh, One extremely generous fan waited in line for me at the gallery signing afterward with a copy of Journal 3 for Alex to sign, explaining to him that I had cracked the cipher and had asked for the autograph to be made out to Grunkle Mike, Aww, which mm. he graciously did, as did Jason, Ariel Hirsch, and Rob Renzetti. It remains one of my most prized possessions. I've embraced my Grunkle Mike persona. I am, in fact, a great uncle. Oh, that's awesome! So cute. I'd even ran a 10K through Walt Disney World in 2016 dressed as Grunkle Stan. Whoa! <laughs> Something I plan to repeat this November as I grow painfully close to Stan's age. <laughs> this email went on a bit longer than I planned, so my apologies for that. No, no, no apologies no, at all. Don't. We love when things <laughs> this is wonderful. Are long. <laughs> yeah, we talked yeah. about Weird Al for an hour. <laughs> yeah! Who do you think we are? <laughs> Just like you, it brings me a great deal of joy reliving that experience, and I hope this adds something to the Cypher Hunt canon. Oh, absolutely. Yes. But I have to emphasize, while I am very proud to have deciphered the final clue, it literally took hundreds of loyal, determined fans to get the hunt to that point, and then a handful of brave souls to venture... Into the woods. And out of the woods. Into the woods and out of the woods and not before dark. Oh, no, it was still very dark, yeah. I mean, you kind of you kind of have to take that journey, you know? It's kind of... true. After the Polybius solution, it was the very definition of a team effort. Aw, it's true. Best regards, Mike Antonucci, Grunkle Mike, running is funny on Twitter. Well, there you have it. I mean, that's, uh, that's a pretty major correction to our Cypher Hunt episode that the... Is that the of, hmm? first time that someone who wrote one of the things we read on the podcast delivered an addendum themselves? Ah, uh, it's possible. I mean, that goes to show the type of reach we had with those episodes. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, floored and, and honored the, that it's gotten the response that it's gotten. And thank you, Mike, uh, for, for sending that email and for, uh, you know, correcting us and, and, and allowing us to properly credit you for uh, that amazing solution. Thank you to Tony for guesting on both the stream and the podcast. Thank you so much. It has been an absolute time Thank blast uh, getting to time. time. All right, I'm done with the time. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to Brian Brian for making the instrumental to our theme song. Uh, thank you to Alex Hirsch for voicing Stan in the Hall of Conspiracies intro, singing the outro cover of My Hearts in Gravity Falls as Seuss with an instrumental by Cooper C. Spacito, and voicing our Patreon shoutouts along with Jason Ritter. If you want to find more episodes of this podcast, go to our host network where you can find other shows like Escape from Vault Disney, hey. How Did This Not Get Made, hey. Come On for Hooklepods, and Woo. Pod Made You Special. That's Woo. true! I am on Twitter at Tony Goldmark. My show Escape from Vault Disney is on Twitter at EFED Podcast. Escape from Vault Disney, it's on Pipe Dream Podcast. It's wherever else podcasts are available. Uh, every week, uh, the randomizer picks something on Disney Plus for us to cover, and then we we cover it. So uh, check it out. It's a good time. And please check out the newest episode at the time of this release, uh, Chippendale Rescue Rangers 2022, featuring your curators, Charlie Marlowe, Ella Chesery, and Shelby Sessler. While you are there on PipeDreamPodcast.com, you can find a link to our show's social medias, Discord server, and our Patreon, patreon.com slash mysteryshack. $3 gets you a shout-out at the end of episodes. $5 will get you into an exclusive Discord channel, and $40 will get you voice or art commissions from Charlie or myself. You can check out our merch store at crowdmade.com slash collections slash mystery shack look back. And you can contact us at mystery shack look back at gmail.com. Uh, the Hall of Conspiracies theme is Lentil Dentist. Uh, it's a remix of a segment that I was on our podcast 49 episodes ago. <laughs> That's true. There is a link in the description. It's a full song. There's lyrics and stuff. It's wild. It's great. I would love to hear the full thing sometime soon. Thank you to Tsunami Holmes on Tumblr for the Stanford handwriting font in our thumbnails. Adam, 
Thank you for making all of the right choices in your spit-themed Select Your Own Cheese venture, because you got to the ending in which our spit is removed from our audio tracks, and they sound fantastic. <laughs> Shows that there are no spit noises in our podcast. By doing a smooch sound, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and Ella wrote the theme song, You Heard It Up Front, but now the beautiful artist Jesus Ramirez is going to do a little cover for us. Yeah! You can find the full song at elochezer.bandcamp.com Take me back to the place I know with the mystery shack and the forest gnomes I've already packed so come on let's go don't get me started my heart's in gravity falls dudes Hey, it's Dipper Pines, and I'm here to read the Patreon shoutouts. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to be doing this by myself. Wiggity, wiggity, what's up, dude bros? Oh, I'm no. Dippy Fresh, no, and no, I no. came because I heard someone wanted me to read some names in a list. No, no, no. <laughs> no yeah. Dippy Fresh, I, I, please, I can do this by myself, actually. Uh, so you, if you want to just go skateboard or do whatever you were doing before, I can I can do this all by myself. <laughs> Never gonna happen. Let's get stiggity started. Oh, stiggity started. All right, Daddy Driftwood. <laughs> Friendly local geek. Daddy Buttons. Sterling Axel. Fun boringness. Hugh Salinas. Juno Series. David Gansel. Liz Clark. Richard Scanland. What's up? Jamie Belts. <laughs> Your voice cracks. Mine doesn't, because I'm better. Ryan Faber. <laughs> the crack is, is a feature, not a bug. Stephen Patrick Mulholland. G -g 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 Gwen Prime. J -j Junior Bruh. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say Junior Bruh. You don't have to do that. Junior Bruh. You're trying your best, bro. You got it. Joseph Jones. Oliver Pluto. Pity Piranha Plant. Elizabeth Newenfelt. Mumble Team D. Wumble Team? You're making that up. Vanilla Zucker. No, I'm not. Ro Davis. Adam with two A's. A D and an M. <laughs> I'm sliding into your DMs. Delphine D Ducey. Please don't slide into my DMs. May. May I slide into your DMs? Jesse Marie McDougal. <laughs> Absolutely not. B. Calisota. But what if I send you cool memes, Rich no thanks to be fresh. This is the end of our interaction for the rest of all time. Samantha Angley. Easy snake oven. And Spencer Neil Campbell. Please get me out of this room with to be fresh immediately. Let's have a pizza party. I'm going to slide into your DMs later. Love Dipper. you, Dipper. I don't love you. Please never slide into my DMs. I hope I never, ever, ever, ever see Let's you again. Let's have I you a pizza worse. party. Let's have a pizza party. Let's have a pizza Patreon.com slash mystery share. Donate now.